Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the Catholic Talk Show. Today, we're going to be talking about five things that Protestants get wrong about Mary. Yeah, these are the most commonly held uh, misunderstandings about what Catholics actually believe about our Blessed Mother. So if all generations are to call her blessed, let's figure out why. Back in the studio with you guys, Ryan, Father Rich, good to be here with you. Hey, guys. Uh, lo- Always great to be with you guys. Loving this topic, loving my mama. Yeah. Mama, mama's boy, we've I'm talked about that totally before. Totally mama's boy. I, I played football on a team called the Mama's Boys at Ave Maria University. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> what was your record? We were actually undefeated. I think we... I think we were undefeated. Of we course actually you were. were. Oh, <laughs> Some of the guys we used to play with are probably going to get on our feet and be like, hold on just a second. Now hold up there, Pagano. <laughs> I scored four touchdowns on you. <laughs> <laughs> well, Padre, you're not feeling so good today, so we're going we're gonna to take it easy on you, but he's going to brave through it, right? Oh, yeah, man. Look, Mary, Mary's going to All Mary's for the glory of God, man. Yeah. Feeling oh. a little under the weather, but no. Anything for, anything for you guys, anything for our listeners. And anything to proclaim the goodness, especially of the Immaculate Heart of Mary. Yeah. Yeah. So there's always so much dispute and so much misunderstanding around what Catholics actually believe about the Blessed Mother. Uh, And Protestants, that's one of the things that they really point to a lot of times to say that Catholics are wrong about theology or whatever. But I really believe that those truly stem from deep misunderstandings of what we actually believe as Catholics about uh, the Virgin Mary. Uh, so we're going to look at those five most commonly held misconceptions, and we're going to unpack those so that we can uh, explain, and so that people out there, when you're getting these um, things thrown at you, that you can also explain to Protestants what it is Catholics actually believe about Mary. And to be able to have a deeper discussion mm-hmm. about you know what Catholics actually believe, because when it comes to one of the misconceptions, which I'm sure that you're about to cover, is that we worship Mary. That is the first one we are going to cover. And we absolutely do not worship the Virgin Mary. There is, in no way, shape, or form, do Catholics worship Mary. And if we ever hear that charge, that is absolute slander. Um, Yeah, it's usually connected to the statue thing, too, Mm -hmm. uh, which is a visible representation of the family of Mm -hmm. God, Mm -hmm. you know. And from an outsider's perspective, especially somebody that doesn't grow up with Catholic sentiment or sensibility— seeing, you know, an Italian or a, a Filipino lady kneeling yeah. and, and kissing and reverencing a statue, it seems like, one, we're worshiping statues. Two, it looks like we're worshiping whatever that statue is, is yeah. uh, you know, representing. Mm. Um, and that, that down to the very core of what is popular piety is the pietistic response to the College of the Saints as well as to those who we seek intercession from. And the Blessed Virgin Mary in the scriptures has said that she is to be called blessed by every generation and that her maternal entrustment is to all generations. So to seek that maternal care is something that has enriched my life tremendously, for sure. Yeah, I mean, it's right in the official documents of the Catholic Church, uh, Lumen uh, Gentium. Uh, It says... No creature could ever be counted as equal as with the incarnate word of the Redeemer. The church does not hesitate to profess the subordinate role of Mary. I mean, this is official teaching restated time and time and time again. We do not consider her divine. We do not consider her an equal with Jesus. We do not consider her the fourth part of the Trinity. She is not a goddess. In no way, shape, or form do Catholics worship Mary, and we openly profess her subordinate role to Mary. Mary has no light of her own. All of her light is a reflection of her son. She is like the moon in that way. Mm -hmm. Well said. I think she's adorable, though. (laughs) (laughs) Well, there's there's a difference in venerations um, that the church has, and we said that about statues, and there's dulia, hyperdulia, and all, all of those. And Mary is, dulia is veneration in the way that um, well, Dulia with saints is a way that you hold them up as a hero in the faith. Hyperdulia is the, um, I guess, the more fervent version of that that is due only to Mary because of her role in our redemption, which mm-hmm. is not a, um, 
not directly the redemption doesn't come from her, but her participation in the redemption, her role as the co-redemptrix. So just a couple of months ago, I met Sam Jones, who has more NBA titles than anybody else except Bill Russell. And the guy's probably in his 90s now. And I mean, talk about like, whoa, you know, there's a ton of respect, a ton of reverence. And I'm paying him that due respect as a basketball player, you know, and, and shaking his hand and, and kind of revering his his uh, his virtue on the basketball court. I mean, truly a, a tremendous uh, example of greatness on the floor. And, you know, I think we could see it in, in civilization and society and the way that we interact with people. You know, when there's greatness among us, there's a natural response to that. And, you know, the the admiration that builds, the reverence that builds for virtue and greatness is something rooted deeply within the human response to that reality. So it, we see it in, in life. And why would we not attribute it to true holiness? I mean, we're talking about Sam Jones, who is truly great at basketball, but why not to the greatest of virtues? Right? Yeah. And and I, I've been uh, I've been in conversations with people after you know, their spouse has died after a long marriage or a, a son passed away from a wreck or whatever. And, and there was a, there was a, a supernatural sense of their presence among them. Right. And, and I don't know, you know, it's private revelation, personal revelation, but you know, Mary is present to us, right? Not, not as Jesus is present to us. I think through Christ, through the Holy spirit, she becomes present to us because of the kingdom of God, because of how God established order among those who are living and dead. And I, I mean, there, there's that too, where I think people, you know, ask her to pray for them and her presence is felt among them. And this is in generations and generations. This is no like special thing right now. Mm -hmm. This is something that has been going on Back for to the earliest church. It, it's centuries, you know, and, and then, you know, Jesus on the cross before he died, gave, you know, gave John mm -hmm. the church, uh, his mother. Yeah, and that's know? another thing that Protestants get wrong is that she is not their mother also, that she is only more or less inconsequential. She is a woman who happened to give birth to Jesus. And I hear that, and I'm like... Oh, my heart deflates when yeah, I hear it's, that. It, it's so obstinate that they... they I wouldn't even say it's obstinate. It's just, it's sad because they're missing out on a whole nother avenue of, of growing, close to growing closer to Christ. Yeah, she yeah. is because your mother too. When you look at, when you look at uh, one of the titles of Our Lady is model of all Christians. There has never been anyone in the history of the church, in the history of loving Christ, that, that truly loves completely. And the Blessed Mother, she loves completely and she can teach us a lot about how we may devote ourselves in true love and a total consecration to Jesus, she helps us with that. Yeah, I mean, if you think about how much you love your own mother, and then you have to think of how much more Jesus, who has the perfection in him of all things, the perfect love for he has his, for his mother, and if we are to be like Jesus in all things, then we need to also have that perfect love for his mother that he had. So right there, just logically, that if you want to call yourself a Christian, you have to love the Virgin Mary as your mother. Otherwise, you are setting yourself uh, in opposition to our Lord. That's and I, I think it just logically flows, and I don't think they understand that, and yeah. it's a real shame. I think I think there's hesitation with uh, Protestants because you know they don't know if they're going to find this sort of a cult or whatever. You know, it just gets it's a little it's too Romish. It's too yeah, and and then you know you go back and you say. Well, I mean, you've never prayed a rosary. You you know, you've never looked at this this theology. You've mm -hmm. never so there's the other side of it where it's like, yeah, you don't want to dive deep, but there's also the rational and the theological side of it that makes a lot of sense too. Yeah, I mean, this was one of the last things our Lord said from the cross, and when He uh, had John bring her into her home and said, uh, "Behold your mother." I mean, He was saying that to all of us. That was. Mm -hmm. You know, Scripture has so many senses of understanding, and there was the actual immediate sense that John, behold your mother, take her into your home. But that was also a command for all the Christians that would come uh, for the generations after, behold your mother, this is your mother. And for Christians who do not view Mary as their mother, they are orphans. They are orphaned Christians, and it's sad. And she's waiting for them to all come home to her. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and we think of Pentecost, the the birth of the church. 
the apostles in the upper room gathered around Our Lady. Absolutely. And Our Lady was present for the birth of the church. Yeah. And and the church is held up to be feminine in the sense that she is Holy Mother Church. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and to realize that our Blessed Mother, you know, explicates that she, she, you know, she lives that out in her maternal nature, teaching us what church really is. Yeah. And there's this play I went to go see. And uh, for the first time ever, I reflected on what it was like for Jesus when he came back from the dead for those 40 days and he encountered his mother. Can you imagine just the love, the tears, the, I mean, that's just beautiful. Mm -hmm. Right. And you know, like, I mean, like, this is Jesus. This is our Savior. This is our Lord. This is his heart. This is his mother. Why would we not love her the same way he does? Absolutely. You know? And what is what is Christ accomplishing among us? Is it just an isolated relationship with him where we're just adoring him and that's yeah. it? And then exclusive of any type of other relationship? No, like Christ is establishing a greater unity among us. Right. And, you know, of course, that would start with his mother. Yeah. But then that would be extended to all all people. Yeah. And and Christ's love is victorious and over every type of boundary. And what is he establishing? He's establishing the kingdom on earth. And that can only be seen by our interconnected love and our devotion to Christ who has accomplished this great work. Yeah. Are, I mean, if we are like a family. Yeah. I mean, we are we are a very big family with saints, with people who have gone before us, men and women of goodwill. These people are constantly in heaven praying for us, right? And and we're interacting with the supernatural through prayers with Christ, but Christ is using these people. It's his will to bring these people to heaven, to use them as intercessors for us so that we can grow mm -hmm. close to them mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. You know, devotions to St. Joseph, to, you know, other saints. It's it's a very common thing, right? And But but it, it speaks to what you're saying is God has, we are, we are a family. We are brothers and sisters in Christ. And that doesn't just stop at this this level, this, this earthen, you know, pilgrimage that we're on. It's also the heavenly banquet too, as Absolutely. well. Now, before we get into another one, why don't you tell everyone where they can get into deeper communion with us? <laughs> <laughs> in order to do that, go to catholictalkshow.com. There you'll be able to see every way that you could listen in or view our content on YouTube. If you do go to YouTube, be sure to type in Catholic Talk Show. And when our page comes up, be sure to hit subscribe and click the bell next to the subscribe button so that you will be able to get every type of production that we put out there right in your feed. So we want to give a big shout out, most importantly, to our patrons. Patreon.com forward slash Catholic Talk Show gives you the ability to support us financially so that this show may continue far into the future and reach new markets by your generosity. So we want to give a big shout out and a thank you to all of our patrons. And di diving in more deeply to the Blessed Virgin Mary, I've been consecrated uh, to Our Lady for, for many, many years. My first consecration was a Louis de Montfort consecration, 33-day mm -hmm. consecration. That's, a, that's an amazing thing. It is not a to be confused powerful devotion. 33 days to morning glory. That, yes. that book has been is popular, but is this that particular a, devotion Father is... Father Calvary? Calvary? No, yeah. Gailey. 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 Yeah, Gailey. Gailey's yeah. a great, great guy. I spoke on a panel with him for Our Lady of Fatima out in California. Tremendous guy. He's done a wonderful job in promoting the consecration. And it's it's a nice first step in yeah. in consecration to Our Lady. But the the Louis de Montfort is like the real Me deal, potatoes. buddy. I mean, that it is an intense consecration that will basically demo your whole yeah. soul and then rebuild you yeah. in devotion to Christ. And yeah. it's a total total consecration to Jesus through Mary. And I don't think there's ever been uh, better you know, prayer in my uh, life. Yeah. Your life. <laughs> oh my goodness! It, it 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 really was life changing. And I had I did that like three times in the formation process of becoming a priest. And then obviously when I became a priest, I did my consecration to Our Lady of La Leche yeah. at the first shrine in the United States of America in St. Augustine at, at Mission Nombre de Dios, and to Queen of Peace in Medjugorje right after I was ordained. Wow. Yeah, I mean, for as far as the consecration goes, it was it was. It's if anybody is struggling with God's will in their life, this is the prayer. It is the prayer that will uh, put divine intervention in your life to give you attention to where you are right now in your life and having peace there or directing you to it's, where you need to go. That like, is, it is a great that point. Important. It's true. That's a great point because what you come in contact with is Our Lady's fiat mihi secundum verbum tuum, 
may it be done unto me according to your word, according to your will. Yeah. That that fiat voluntas tua that's in Our Lady that is accomplished most perfectly in yeah. her yes to God is something that you come in contact with, and it strengthens you over the 33 days of, of consecration yeah. to be inclined and resolved to to fulfill that yes in your own life. You guys know I got I left the seminary during a 33 day consecration. Oh no, no. way! Yeah. Oh wow, that, that's happened. reassuring. Yeah, and I met my in that same 30 days. I didn't date her, but yeah. I saw, saw her, met her, the woman who I married. So it was pretty cool. Mm-hmm. Um, the yeah. other thing too is I consecrate my children. You know, every single one when they're in the womb, my wife and I pray a uh, consecration prayer. Um, and I have also led others to this consecration through their struggles with their vocation. Like, I don't know what God wants me to do with this business or this whatever, you know? And it's like, Hey, this works, you know? And so I've, uh, you know, walked with some people during one too, as well. I think it might be a good idea to do one ourselves, you know, with our patrons or some of our, well, leading up to the pilgrimage that we're doing in Poland, there will be a 33-day consecration that will culminate at Our Lady of Chestahova. Bam. And we're going to consecrate the parish, St. John Paul II, to Our Lady of Chestahova, and then our own personal consecration as yeah. well. So I'm, I'm okay, really looking then. forward well, to that. That's yeah. my next yeah. consecration. Yeah. <laughs> so so I, I think you know the, I, the concept of consecration uh, flows into this next thing that Protestants get wrong about Mary. And what one thing that Protestants get completely wrong about Mary is that she cannot intercede on our behalf. Mary is the most powerful intercessor on her behalf, but in no way does that take away or make her uh, or reduce the role of Jesus as the sole mediator between man and God. And that's something that Protestants just fundamentally do not understand the Catholic theology about. Mm -hmm. And I think the wedding feast at Cana gives the dynamics most perfectly. So the petition goes to to Christ Mm -hmm. and Our Lady intervenes and intercedes. Why do you think John included that? Just because it was, there's so many details of particular events that could have been included. And John happened to choose running this little, it could have been just, hey, Jesus made wine out of water. That's more than enough. Yeah. And then it would be just associated with marriage and we could look more deeply right. at marriage. But no, it was I mean, so was, important it, was it Our Lady? It's a, it's a good point to realize that it wasn't the Blessed Mother no. who, who changed the water into wine. Mm. But, but there the was servants an, went to her yeah, and the she went to the Lord. intercession that occurred shows us her identity. And scripture is speaking to us in this account who the Blessed Virgin Mary is in the mystery of salvation and who the blessed mother is in relationship to Christ. And it also shows the logical flow that after the servants went to Mary, Mary went to Jesus. Then Jesus mediated heaven and earth by being able to use the divine power to take an earthly substance and with that uh, heavenly power, turn it into something new. And that's exactly how the, the, I guess the, the Gantt chart of, redemption works, you know, or of mediation. Mary is not, we're not praying to Mary and Mary's throwing down miracles for us. She's going to her son. Mm-hmm. And that's ex- so the fact that John included that and knew how important it was to include that seemingly inconsequential detail is, is so important. You yeah. Know? I mean, it's like everything in God's creation and, and plan for us happens for a reason. And it, and just, just because Jesus died for our sins and <coughs> sent the Holy Spirit among us to save our souls and we need contrition. And that's great, but it, it does. It's, it's like, it's like half of dinner. You know what I mean? It's like just the appetizer. The rest of it is his, his plan throughout all this stuff, right? It's, it's like, why, why would God come to us through a woman who would be his mother? I mean, it, it didn't have to, if it was that sanitary, you know, if that was that, that salt, if it was that sanitized as a, you know, salvation history, no, he gave us a mother. Mm -hmm. He had a mother. Mm -hmm. Why would he not love his mother? You know, you just start going into all these like reasonable, you know, questions like that just makes sense. (laughs) And, but what you're doing is you're taking the whole story, Mm -hmm. right? Not a part of it. You're taking the whole story and you're, you're embracing it all, you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I agree. And even, even on a personal level, you know, from my experience of the love of Jesus, it came through the Blessed Virgin Mary. 
When I first got a Bible in my hand, there was a devotional card of Mater Dolorosa, the mother of suffering. And I began to really relate to her and learn how to pray the rosary. And by praying the rosary, my devotion to Our Lady continued to grow and grow and grow. And I think for my overall consciousness and my overall psychological makeup at that time, you know, growing up in a divorced family and and really having my mother as the as the, you know, object of of one discipline that that she provides me discipline but she also provides me the day-to-day love and the sustenance and the roof over my head and all of these different things that she provides that what was absent was you know my father doing those types of things and not to speak ill of my father I love my dad very very much but that that has a, a certain correlation to how God got a hold of my heart because by way of intercession of Our Lady, she was the one who brought me to Christ, and Christ revealed the Father to me, and then my own father wounds began to go undergo the greater healing mm. that led me to realize, who am I in the, in the mystery of what God is calling me to? And priesthood was born out of that type of devotional life, but it all started with the hand of the Blessed Virgin Mary extended to me walking me through this great yeah. revelation. Yeah, Mary is a gift to all peoples from Jesus. Jesus is giving his mother to us from the cross. And in no way, you know, in uh, First Timothy, it's there is one mediator between God and, and man, and that is Jesus Christ. Mm-hmm. Now, the, in no way does Mary's role as an intercessor somehow negate, it. negate mm-hmm. or obscure that singular mm-hmm. role of Christ mm-hmm. as our mediator. Because Christ is mediator as atoning sacrifice. He made a blood sacrifice and an offering for our sins before the Father, the just judge. So, you know, like our sins, there's consequences to our sins. So it is Jesus who is purely the mediator between man and God before our own sinfulness and before a just and righteous God. Yeah, and mediation and intercession are absolutely not the same Mm -hmm. thing. Mm -hmm. That's a good distinction. It is. Intercession, this is what the Catechism says, uh, Catechism 2634. Intercession is a prayer of petition which leads us to pray as Jesus did. He is the one intercessor with the Father on behalf of all men, especially sinners. And then it follows, for there is one God and there is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as ransom for all. But we are not asking Mary uh, to usurp that role as mediator. We are asking Mary, just like the servants at the wedding of Cana, to say, we have no wine. We're out of wine. We're out of grace. We, We are out of luck. We need help. And you, who... Jesus loves so perfectly. Can you talk to him for us and use your graces by the virtue of the way that you lived to intercede on our behalf? And just as like, you know, in the Old Testament, there's, you'll see a lot of places, the role of the queen mother and people go to the queen mother so that the queen mother can go to the king. And that's exactly the way that the kingdom of it's a foreshadowing Christ, too. That's the way the kingdom yeah. of Christ is set up. And that's the way you know, temporal kingdoms were set up and we go to the queen mother to ask for the graces of the king, period. So you're missing out, Protestants, uh, not having Mary on your side because she she could really help you. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So another thing and that they get, that Protestants get wrong about Mary is uh, that she was perpetually a virgin. And I don't know why they fight this one so hard. I think it's almost to purposely differentiate themselves from Catholicism. Uh, it's not really supported by anything, but I feel like this is almost like a meh, 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 meh kind of rebellion against the church by claiming Mary was not perpetually virgin. Mm-hmm. And it makes no sense to me why they, they fight so hard on that point. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I, I, I think it's not only just the perpetual virginity or worshiping Mary or anything like that. It's I think it just comes down to what you brought out is, you know, desiring to be different. Mm -hmm. And you could see that in children, especially a a large family where kids are trying to maneuver for the affection of their father or mother, and they're expressing themselves in in ways that may be out of bounds just to get attention. Right. And, and they do things, you know, that, that may upset dad or upset mom. Yeah. Protestants rejecting the perpetual virginity is, you know, 
uh, getting a nose ring and dyeing your hair pink. <laughs> <laughs> it just <Yeah>. is. <laughs> but Punk rock it, music, man. But but you know, it's like we're we're seeking affection constantly, and and we want to be different. Mm -hmm. You know, we want to be different, and. Um, I even remember it back with with my sister. My sister was perfect and everything. I mean, she was like homecoming queen and she got all A's and she, you know, she'd never get in trouble. And I was getting in trouble all the time, you know, and looking back at it, it's like, OK, I could see that I was measuring myself to her constantly. Yeah. And which and is a natural thing. It's a do. natural, yeah. a natural thing. Um, but now, thank God, it's like, you know, my sister could be my sister. I could be myself. And there's a greater harmony. And my prayer is that we may come to a, a certain place in all of Christendom that we can appreciate each other in such a deep way. And, and the fact that we are one in Christ, drawing us closer and closer together through our differences to really appreciate, you know, some of these articles of faith like the Blessed Virgin Mary and who she is. Yeah, they always, they'll point to scripture saying, is this not Jesus, the carpenter's sons? Do we not know his brothers and sisters? Yeah. And that's just... Um, it's refuted it's easily, it's refuted though. multiple times because the, that same word for brothers is used all throughout the New Testament. You know, even um, Martin Luther defended the perpetual virginity, and, and and he refuted that specific point. He said, "Christ our Savior, who was the real and natural fruit of Mary's virginal womb, um, that this without the cooperation of man she remained a virgin after." Christ was the only son of Mary and the Virgin Mary bore no children beside him. I am inclined to agree with those who declare that brothers really means cousin here for in Holy writ, the Jews always call cousins brothers. And this was from Luther's uh, sermons on, on the gospel of John. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of the other main Protestant um, figures like Calvin, Zwingli, Cranmer, Wesley, they all defended the perpetual virginity of Mary. Um, so it's it's so strange that that kind of thought has crept into Protestantism, and again, it really is, I think, just a way to separate themselves from Catholicism. Right. Yeah, I got an aunt of mine in Alabama that, like, whenever the Alabama de la Crosses. Oh no, no, different, different. No, oh, no, 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 not no, the no. Italian side. Oh, oh, <laughs> oh not the Italian side. <laughs> this is a yeah, but you know, it's like whenever whenever I'm around her. She immediately starts discussing religion in the Catholic Church, and and it appears like she is basically trying to repeat what is said at her church by her pastor. And I'm just like, this is this is your faith that mm -hmm. you're sharing with me. Mm -hmm. Like you you have to like understand that this is this is what you how you envision your faith being shared. Mm -hmm. And we have to we have to keep that in mind. And I've had numerous experiences with. Families that, you know, come to a wedding and it's it's a mixed religion or, you know, disparity of cult or, you know, and, and there's people that don't have faith or, or atheists or agnostic. And then you have evangelicals, Protestants, all these different people that come into the Catholic Church. And, you know, I'm very open and, you know, conversational and, and I, I don't think I have a threatening presence. So people talk to me genuine, generally. And I, I can't know, tell man, you how pretty many intimidating. <laughs> I can't tell you how many. <laughs> it's so my up. beard. It's yeah, my it beard. Is. But it, I can't tell you how many uh, people have come up to me and they said, well, I've never realized that the Catholic Church teaches that. Or yeah. I, I never realized that that's exactly what, you know. And and I think it just comes down to that because especially if people are being filled, their minds are being filled with, hey, this is what Catholics believe and they're, they're a, you know, a demonic cult and, you know, their Holy Father is yeah. blah, blah, blah. You know, oh, yeah. I, I think all of that is, uh, you know, contributing to their view. Worldview. You yeah. know, yeah. yeah they've had this pounded into their head that, you know, the Romish Catholics are just absolute cultist uh, what? heathens. And if you, if they need to resort to that type of mindset, I mean, that's, a, I think, a defense of them trying to avoid the truth that, is, is so inconvenient to them. Mm -hmm. How do we how do we bring this understanding this relationship to Mary? How do we how do we do this? Uh, how do you do this with different folks? Like, mm -hmm. do you like hey prayer rosary? Like for me with Catholics who are already, I would say uh, they're they're fertile soil. Mm -hmm. Like I, I bring them into the consecration. Like hey, do this. It's great, brother. I'm sharing this with you. Like as a friend. Like if you know. And, and it's, it's terrific, 
But you know, if you're, if you're obviously there are people who are very close, like my aunt where it's like, I just, I don't know where to start. But your relationship is different with your aunt. She has a more superior position over you in her own mindset. So she's not going to be receptive. And and I don't even, I don't even try. Yeah. I I would, I would much rather her just see the way I live my life Mm -hmm. and maybe one day her think that this is something that she wants, Mm -hmm. right. Instead Mm -hmm. of something that I can kind of, but how, how do you, how have you in your ministry what would you say to somebody out there? It's like, hey, this is a, this is a good thing to pass off to somebody. How do we do it? I think you hit on it already. What you just shared, and and I, I have the same style of of delivery. One first and foremost, I am not an apologetics type of a person. Yeah. I'm not discounting it, but in my in my opinion, if I'm coming at a, a conversation where I'm arguing with you and we're in an argumentative state. Over some type of position, scripture. You argue with me quite a bit. We do argue a lot, but, <laughs> but we already we're, we're beginning from the premise of love, so okay. and, and brotherhood. Oh, you know those memes? We should do a meme of you going like this, and then him crying, and me over there just like eating popcorn. <laughs> <laughs> you know the cat? And he's the, yeah, cry, he's the crying lady. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's so accurate. <laughs> <laughs> Lasagna, though. <laughs> um, but you know, one I find to be more effective than that is testimony. And, yeah. and sharing yeah. and listening and, you know, hearing someone out and mm-hmm. responding like I've, li- I've listened to you. I've, mm-hmm. I've heard what you said. And let me share something. Let me share something else. It's done in a conversational, testimonially driven conversation yeah. where it's I'm not trying to prove you wrong. So then at the end of this conversation, you're walking away that, yeah, he... I lost, I lost that battle or whatever. And you're feeling defeated. No, after a conversation over the word of God and revelation and the person of, of Jesus Christ and the blessed Virgin Mary and who she is, it it should leave us uplifted. And, and that should leave both of us in a, in a great place, leaving a a point of conversation, not one person defeated and another person victorious. Absolutely. The art of apologetics is not to win an argument, right? If it's you're, to share what you believe. If you're really good at apologetics, the other person would never even have no, seen it coming. They would never have thought they were in an argument. It would have come off as conversation and discourse. That is apologetics at its finest. Uh, the kind of, I don't know, crass apologetics that has devolved with the advent of the internet where it's people just... Beating you I'm up dropping you a head. truth bomb here. Yeah, sucker, and, and Protestant. It's, so, it's so destructive. It doesn't do anything. It no. just pushes those divisions further. It does. I completely agree with that. So the last thing that I think Protestants get wrong about Mary way too often is they completely misunderstand the Immaculate Conception and the fact that Our Lady was conceived without original sin and what that means and what understanding that informs of the Our Lady in Catholic theology. Yeah. And then the other thing too, is if she was born through a saint, obviously, but a, but a sinner mm-hmm. in, in a womb of someone who was a sinner, like I, there are some really good questions there to, to, there's different ways to approach it too. There's the natural slash supernatural way. Then there's the theological understanding of why God would choose to do that. There's a lot of things to pull together. I think that's one of the reasons why it didn't become a a, a tenet of our faith, a dogma, if you will, you know, for you, until you 1854, know, much right. later. Yeah. Right. And I mean, there were it's... revelations associated with with that title mm-hmm. as well. Um, but but it's important to it's important to realize that um, the Immaculate Conception, as it relates to uh, Mary, is ultimately related to the person of Jesus Christ. And even when we look at the devotion to the rosary, you know, the rosary is associated with Our Lady, yes, but it's the entire meditations are in the context of relating it to Christ. Mm -hmm. So everything related to the identity of the Blessed Virgin Mary comes from that intimate relationship with Jesus. You know, it's interesting, Aquinas rejected um, or argued against the uh, Immaculate Conception. Um, Or natural law? No, like, more just on the chronology of of salvation. That uh-huh. how could she be free from original sin before the expiation on the cross by Christ? That's, that's natural law. I mean, that's not right. theological it's, at all. It's like how, there that is a supernatural gift imposed by our Creator through the womb of her mother Anne, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. To to create Mary in this way. You know, I think a really <clears throat> illustrative foreshadowing in the Old Testament on um, 
understanding the Immaculate Conception is the story of uh, Uzzah. And Uzzah. He, Uzzah. And he was a uh, one of the Israelites. And after one of the, the Israelites used to take the Ark of the Covenant with them out into battle, right? Yep. And because that was their protection, that was their weapon of mass destruction. Yeah, right. right. <laughs> and uh, they they took it out and they they cleaned up on some Philistines. And they're coming back and they're about to go drink some beers. And be like, yeah, kick the you know. And they're carrying it back on the on the sticks and it started to lose balance. And he went to he put his hand on it to touch it. Um, and he was zapped. And he's he was gestorbed, man. Axes on the eyes, right? <laughs> and it killed him. So. Something so pure and something so powerful just to hold the presence of God. I mean, that's the, 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 it, the it, it Ark held, of the Covenant held. It was the, his throne, most, but it held the Ten Commandments and it held, mm-hmm. held the manna. Which are supernatural right. uh, mm-hmm. articles, if you will. Right. Supernatural you relics. Know, relics of the, the existence and the presence of God manifesting himself. But how much more perfect does the new Ark of the New Covenant, Our, our Lady, have to be for... For, for it to to be hold pre- the second person of the Trinity, yeah, to yeah. actually prepare the place where our Lord would come into mm-hmm. the world through His yeah. incarnation. Yep, the seat of mercy, the Ark of the Covenant. Yeah, the, Satis Sapientiae, the mm. seat of wisdom. That's one of the titles of the Blessed Virgin Mary, mm. and Christ sits upon the throne in relationship to sitting upon the lap of the Blessed Virgin Mary. Mm-hmm. And when we think of of God wow. preparing a place. For his only begotten son, of course, it is going to be pure. Yeah. One of my favorites is that people, even Catholics, get this wrong so often. Like it'll be the feast of the Immaculate Conception. They're like, "Well, oh, if Christmas is on the twenty fifth and Jesus was conceived uh, on the eighth, what's going on here?" That's a pretty like they confuse the um, the Annunciation and the Immaculate Conception. The Immaculate Conception has to do oh. with Our Lady being I'd conceived. Say they half. Half. No, that's true. More than I, half yeah, of I've Catholics that. probably think the Immaculate Conception is, is Jesus. Jesus being born. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But 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 because it's conception, or, you know. I mean, another, look in, in a really practical way. I mean, the the feast of the Immaculate Conception is also the remembrance of uh, of Mary's parents um, having relations. You know, mm-hmm. I mean, that's that's what happened. Mary's that's parents, what happened. That's what happened. That's how it works. That's when, how it works. People. When a man loves a woman, a woman has a when stock. A man man. <laughs> loves a woman. Right. Uh, um, but I, I'd like to make another point too: is baptism. So you know, because of original sin, we are in need of washing away original mm-hmm. sin. Mm-hmm. If we are conscious of our sin, not only are we in need of washing away of original sin, we're in need of washing away of personal sin. And why do we wash away original sin? Why do we wash away personal sin? So that we may be in communion with Christ and God and, and Jesus Christ and God. So if if we're being baptized in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and our lives are conformed to Christ, then we need to be prepared. We need to be washed and cleansed in that same manner of communion with God. It depends upon that. That's why when we when we are um, mortally in sin. And we are in need of confession before communion with Christ. We need to be washed in the capacity that closes because of our human sinfulness to Christ and, and our capacity for light and love and the fullness of God closes because of sin. It needs to be opened up and cleaned out. Mm-hmm. So in that, same, in that same manner, why would we say that the Blessed Virgin Mary would have that same type of stain. Mm-hmm. She couldn't because she needed to receive the fullness of God yeah. within her. I think That's a good a, analogy. And I also think a good, a good thing to look at this is that, okay, sure. Um, the Immaculate Conception was only defined in 1854 and then in uh, Ineffabilis Deus, right? Um, but you can look back to the first part of, of the gospels to look at where this comes from. And, you know, there's our, there's our logo of it. And, that's at the Annunciation, hail full of grace, full of grace, um, points to that immaculate conception. You cannot be full of God's grace. You can have much of it, or you could be graced, but being completely full of grace would... You I would mean, have to have the pure capacity of to, receiving to the receive fullness. a full amount of grace. That's absolutely Nobody's right. ever said that to me. Yeah. No, yeah. sir, they have not. <laughs> You're full. And yeah, what's the deal though? Is the, is the angel in, in scripture? Is there a couple different accounts? Because 
So I've heard some people say that the angel knelt before Mary and then doesn't other... give that detail. Okay. Mm-hmm. Gotcha. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, but you know, but it does say the popular angel... devotion. Yeah. You know, yeah. It, it's been depicted in many different ways. Yeah. You know what, actually I want to take this moment. Uh, I want to show you something that our, uh, the amazing and our homeboy and who does so much for us, Howard, Created for oh, us. Oh yeah, this is. Look at this now. Howard, Howard is. Come into the frame real quick. Howard bro. is an amazing artist. It's the golden fisherman. fisherman. Oh yeah, <laughs> and Howard uh, has been sculpting this for us, and I just wanted to take a minute to really recognize this. How beautiful and how talented you are, Howard. Uh, well, thank you. Yeah, this is a sculpture. Uh, h- how did you do this? I mean, you are our Bernini. <laughs> <laughs> No, well, just got a bunch of clay and <laughs> <laughs> see. This is and, why Howard's and on the other down <laughs> and molded it. This is why Howard's on the other side of the camera because his magnetic personality doesn't <laughs> <laughs> shine through. But Howard, I mean, this is absolutely awesome, and uh, you do so much for us, and we're so grateful to yeah, have man, you. Yeah, man, we love you, bro. And we could not do this without Howard, and all your support through Patreon helps us. Get Howard find grooming t- uh, tools. <laughs> yep, and clay <laughs> and clay. But uh, I really, I just wanted to take a minute and show everyone this because this is just awesome artwork. And since we're talking about Gabriel and the Annunciation, um, just you know, thank you and thank you for everything that you do and thank you for well, this. You're welcome, guys. You know how much I uh, love you guys and how much I appreciate working with you guys on this. And stuff, you know how much so. we trust you, Garden Fisherman. <laughs> That's right. It's real fish. <laughs> just eat it. <laughs> just eat it. <laughs> <laughs> show that to the camera real quick. Oh, I've been showing it the whole time. Look at that, though. Yeah. Let's get a good look at that. Beautiful. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> <laughs> So those are five things that Protestants get wrong about Our Lady. And um, I wish they didn't. I wish that they could be wrapped in Our Lady's mantle because it's pretty comfortable in here. Oh, my gosh. And it's it's really comforting. Now, uh, one thing that I would like to do, that we got two more things to do. First, I'd like you to tell everyone about our sponsors. We are most grateful for our sponsors and I have to first start with Hallow. Hallow is the number one Catholic meditation and guided prayer application in the App Store today. Be sure to visit Hallow because when you do, you'll see all sorts of prayer and meditation guided efforts that they have put together in a beautiful and most attractive way. From Teze to Lexio Divina to Rosary and to daily gospel reflections and so much more. This is a beautiful application that you should definitely have on your phone. And if you utilize this platform, you will truly be able to advance in not only your understanding of the Catholic tradition of prayer, but be able to cultivate that in your own practice uniquely to you. This number one Catholic meditation and prayer app is specifically out there for you to grow in your faith. We are so grateful for their work. We are so grateful for their sponsorship. And you should take a moment and check them out because they are truly at the very forefront of technological advancement and the new evangelization. So check out Hallow, Catholic Meditations and Prayer App today. We want to tell you about our sponsor, Exodus 90. Exodus 90 is 90 days of prayer and asceticism, cold showers and devout prayer moving through the book of Exodus so that men could find greater freedom in Christ. This program is a tremendous program that over 20,000 men have already gone through, and you should consider becoming the very next member in this very powerful movement. Please consider to join Exodus 90 now. Check them out. You will not regret it. Ave Maria University, our sponsor, is an institution of higher learning in the Catholic tradition, and one that is very, very dear to me, as I am an alumnus and a graduate of 2008 from the new campus. We were part of the first graduating class, and it is awesome to see how much Ave Maria University has grown and has become not only the youngest Catholic institution, but one of the most powerful, driven in academics and faith. It is a university that appeals to all. And we'd like you to consider becoming a student at Ave Maria University, or if you know someone that is of age that may be looking at colleges and universities around the country, be sure to tell them about Ave Maria. There are over 30 majors. There's programs undergrad as well as postgrad, all the way up to PhDs in theology. You do not want to miss a chance to attend this university. It is surrounded by the oratory, this beautiful church in the middle of Ave Maria town, just 30 miles away from Naples and the beautiful beaches. It's in Southwest Florida. So the weather is beautiful. 
But the greatest thing and the most beautiful thing about the university is the community. The community life is a place where young people find belonging and most importantly, encounter Christ and the beautiful tradition of the Catholic faith. So check out Ave Maria University today. You won't regret it. All right. Thanks, Padre. That was really good. And thank you to our sponsors. You really, they really help us uh, along with our patrons are able to continue making the show. And we're so happy to support them too, because let me tell you, they, yeah. they've made some beautiful products. Yeah, I mean, yeah. our sponsors are awesome and we don't work with just anyone and uh, a lot of gratitude towards them. But before we go, we do have an inquisition. Oh. And I I'm know sick, you're dude. not feeling good. I know, which makes it so much more delightful for me <laughs> because it's just twisting it in a little bit harder. <laughs> Should I start crying up? Yeah. <laughs> Mama. Oh, you should probably pray to Mary first because it's oh, going to be a I difficult pr- one. Well, I keep my rosary close. All by. right. So the Inquisition. Yes. Human beings. Mm-hmm. Jesus Christ. Human beings. Human beings. Beans. Okay. Beans. Jesus Christ was like us in all ways. Mm-hmm. And that means, physiologically, he was exactly a human. He had a better nose than mine, though. Yeah, probably. Sure. Um, Got like a pointy a better nose. Beard. Better beard. Much too. better yeah, beard. Your beard sucks. Dude. Yeah, I know, Sorry. man. I trimmed it too close. Okay, quit stalling. So, Beans. human bean. That means that Jesus Christ had DNA. Mm-hmm. But... In any sort of conception, there is two sets of DNA, one from the father and one from the mother. Mm. But since he was immaculately conceived, where did the other half of his DNA come from? Or did he only have Our Lady's DNA? Ex nihilo. Out of nothing, God provided that strand. So was Mary's DNA there? And was it half immaculate? Oh, of course. Or ex nihilo? It has to be within the, the lineage of Our Lady. That's the whole, that's the whole point. So half of his DNA was Our Lady's? Yeah. So then also in the womb, it is also known that DNA from the new baby transfers into the mother. Look at that. And that the She's mother the first can, to receive communion. The mother also carries the DNA of the child with her the rest mm-hmm. of her life. So did Our Lady also contain in her the actual DNA of Jesus Christ? And that is why she is called the spouse of the Holy Spirit. She is received in a spousal, conjugal manner this beautiful line that comes perfectly from the father and that must be seen in DNA. So half ex nihilo de- yeah. DNA and half Mary's DNA. Absolutely. All right. I think you, you accept did pretty, that? I accept that answer. Praise the Lord. <laughs> We're friends now. You did good Padre. <laughs> oh no, no. I got to wash my hands now. I've got hand sanitizer here. Yeah, Hold please. On. Yeah. You got the funk, man. I don't want that. <laughs> All right. So you got the funk. Uh, got the funk. That was a good Thank episode. you guys for watching. Great. Yeah. yeah. Mary, m- make make uh, Padre Sicky over here feel better. <laughs> I appreciate. I would appreciate. He already that. looks like he's feeling better. He does. Yeah, uh-huh. you got better color. Yeah, it's coming. You look like an 18th century uh, Catholic statue. You're all rosy now. Speaking of 18th <laughs> century, I uh, you owe me something, and that means a shave of the chin. What's happening? Yeah. And yeah. the mutton chops. That's because yeah. you lost. And like always, I'm over here just eating popcorn and watching. <laughs> no, you're eating lasagna. lasagna. <laughs> uh, so, hey. So my brothers and sisters, we thank you so much for joining us on the Catholic Talk Show each and every week. We appreciate having the friendship that we do online on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, as well as the friendship of all of our patrons at patreon.com forward slash Catholic Talk Show. If you're not a patron, please consider, because by your monetary donations, you're able to help us grow the show and reach new markets and reach people that may, like in this regard, not have a lot of love for Our Lady. And hopefully, if you're one of those people who are considering the Catholic Church and what the Catholic Church teaches, hopefully this has helped you today, and we'll see you next week. Mm